Okay, so here we go. Uh, yeah, so last time we were talking about parameterizing surfaces. And again, uh, you know, there is no single, you know, here's how you do it to parameterizing surfaces. Uh, there's various different kinds of surfaces about which you know certain things, for which you have certain foots and certain doors, and certain tools can be useful in different circumstances. So I'm going to show you the various tools by way of examples. And then you have to just be prepared, right, for looking at any given surface that you need to parameterize and try to figure out, wait a minute, which one of the tools that I know is most appropriate for this circumstance. Okay, so I like this one. Um, this is kind of a weird uh, uh, idea, but uh, this relates to an example of a parametric curve that we talked about back in chapter one. And it was the one with the bicycle wheel. Y'all remember the bicycle wheel? And there was a reflector, and then as the reflector, as the bicycle wheel goes down, the reflector traces out this weird sort of zigzaggy kind of pattern. Um, so the big trick there was to realize that the reflector, uh, this very weird curve that it traces, is just much simpler to understand as a sum of the axle which is a straight line constant speed, and sort of what you might call the radius, which as the wheel rotates just goes around in a circle, right? And so the components are actually fairly easy to write down, even though the sum itself is uh, intimidating and scary and uh, otherwise sort of uh, intractable without breaking it down like that. Okay, so same kind of a deal here. Here's the circumstance. This is, again, a weird example, but uh, suppose we have a surface that is a graph, like this uh, surface S here. Okay. okay, that's not hard, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to imagine that sticking out of this surface, there are these little hairs like this, and so maybe this is uh, somebody's head and they've got a static electricity situation, whatever. Right? But the hairs are all perpendicular to the surface. They're all of length one. And with that said, we're going to be interested in... Oh, uh, that was the wrong color. Uh, sorry. Um, we're going to be interested in this surface that's formed by the ends of the hairs. Right? And that surface is uh, a lot harder to get our hands on. And uh, frankly, I'm not immediately clear in my mind of how I would even write the equation for that surface, a very different surface. Okay, Okay. so uh, that said, the foot in the door, the way we're going to get this done is we're going to realize first that it's not that much trouble to write down points like this, right? Points like this, they're on a graph, and we know how to do parametric graphs, right? Um, it's also going to be not that bad as it will turn out to find these vectors perpendicular to that surface of length one. That, you know, stuff to be done, but that we'll be able to do. So the point is we're going to understand points on our H surface, not independently, but as being green plus orange. That's our big picture strategy. Does that, everybody see what I'm going to try to do here? All right, uh, so yeah, let's start with the points on this surface. This surface, of course, is a graph. We can use the graph parameterization, and we're done with that part. Graph parameterization is a freebie. Okay, okay next, um, <clears throat> I need to figure out how to understand these vectors in. Uh, they are perpendicular to this S surface. I need to understand vectors that are perpendicular to a surface. Uh, that should uh, ring a bell, perhaps. Vectors that we know how to generate that are perpendicular to a surface, gradients. We know gradients are perpendicular to level sets. Right? So what I'm going to do is say, even though this surface was given to me as a graph, I'm going to reinterpret it as being a level set of this other function. All right now, we talked about that kind of stuff back in uh, chapter two, I guess it was, early chapter two before we got to derivatives. Um, and uh, that equation is equivalent to this equals zero. 
And so we're talking about a level set of this function. Well, once you know what function you're interested in taking a level set of, uh, we can forget about all that graph business. Uh, this function here, its gradient, uh, its gradient is going to be perpendicular to the level set. Right, so gradients are perpendicular to level sets. Is everybody happy with that? Um, by the way, uh, uh, I guess I'll go ahead and remind y'all that uh, some time ago, again, you know, back in chapter two, early chapter two, um, we uh, talked about how sometimes the surface comes to you as a graph, but you need to interpret it as a level set, or sometimes vice versa. And this is one of those times, right, that it came to us as a graph, but it was more useful to us, at least for the second half of this question, to view it as being a level set, and so we have to know how to make that sort of shift and how to reinterpret it in terms of a different function. Okay. All right, so cool. So we have our gradient vector here. Um, <clears throat> not exactly what I wanted, at least so this gradient is perpendicular to what it needs to be perpendicular to, but it remains. What I actually want to know is uh, this vector here, like this, that is a unit vector pointing in that same direction. And so we just normalize it. And now we've got the unit vector pointing in the perpendicular direction just as we desired. Everybody okay with that? So now let's put the pieces together. We've got everything uh, that we need. Uh, let me just clean up the mess and let's zoom out so we can see all of this together. Um, we uh, have this point as a function of s and t using the graph parameterization. <coughs> we have now this vector in as a function of s and t using old tricks from chapter two about gradients. And what we're interested in, this point there, in other words, a representative point on our on our surface H is very simply just green plus orange. And so our purple surface is parameterized by that. So, not that different from the bicycle wheel example, right? So the, uh, the green was relatively easy, the orange was relatively e not that bad, and, uh, but uh, put them together and it allows us to represent something that otherwise would have been All right, next little trick that I want to show you all. Uh, this is one of my favorites. I think it's kind of fun. Um, it is, uh, this again, this is not a formalized method, but this is a trick that I think is super handy. And why I think about it is look for a way to create your own new coordinate system appropriate to whatever it is that you're looking at. So, uh, for example, let's imagine that we want to parameterize this, uh, what we call a torus. Um, so the surface of a donut, I emphasize, it's just the surface. It's not the doughy part, right? It's just the glaze part, just the outside surface, right? Okay, how would we parameterize that surface? It's not a graph. Can't use the graph parameterization. Um, <clears throat> so, um, here's my idea. If we, in fact, lived on this surface, right? We, conveniently, we don't. Conveniently, we live on the surface of a ball, right? So we live on a sphere. We have an existing coordinate system for how to keep track of where we are on the surface of the Earth. It's longitude and latitude, right? Which we use because it fits naturally with the shape of the world that we live on. If we lived on this world, what would take the place of longitude and latitude? Now, there is no single answer to this. It's not a matter of right versus wrong. This is just, a, you know, um, pick something that seems natural and convenient and reasonable, and there's different ways to do it. So I'm just going to show you one way to do it that I feel like makes a lot of sense, uh, but there are, of course, others. So if I were at this location here, in fact, let me zoom in so I can see better. Okay, here we go. If I were at this purple point, I would point out first 
that that is a rotation by some angle uh, of a point over here in the XZ plane. Right, so how far would you have to rotate from within the XZ plane to get to that point? So this, you might call it this, uh, this uh, you know, angle on the Z axis, as it were, over here. I'm going to call that S. I think that's a reasonable uh, first coordinate, first second, doesn't matter. Um, and then the other angle that I would like to describe is how far do you have to rotate up to get to that point? Uh, from what you might call the equator. You imagine sort of an equator going around the outer, uh, the, uh, the, the widest part of the donut. Right. So uh, these two angles, S and T, I think would be a pretty good coordinate system. Yeah. Notice that T is actually a lot like latitude. And S is a lot like longitude. So it's pretty pretty natural, pretty reasonable choice. Okay. Again, there's other ways to do it. I'm just going to run with this one. Now, that said, the uh, very first thing we're going to do is try to figure out uh, how to understand uh, this dark blue point here. Uh, how do I use S and T to figure out that dark blue point? And in fact, I'm only going to need T. Uh, here's another picture of that dark blue point um, right there. And I make the observation. Here's another vector addition observation. It's going to be that vector plus that vector. A is a constant. Right? And this B vector is going to depend on the angle T. Uh, the, uh, let's see here, the angle T, again, reminder, is this angle like so, uh, kind of, you know, uh, upward from the positive part of the x-axis. So there's going to be some trig. By the way, I'm going to leave these details for y'all. I think this is a good, healthy exercise to uh, think through and make sure that you, can, uh, to, that you can fill in these details. But given that this red vector has magnitude B and has a certain angle T up from the positive part of the x-axis, write the coordinates of that red vector. Likewise, write the coordinates of this constant orange vector here. And what you're going to get, what you should get, is this right here. The orange vector is A00. And that red vector is this thing right here. Uh, again, uh, that's, a, that's a good exercise. It's uh, details um, to, be, uh, to be thought through carefully. Everybody see what I want you to do? Okay. Now, the vector addition kicks in, and of course, then the, the, this point that I'm calling P uh, is then just the sum of those, which is that. Okay, fine. So that's uh, uh, kind of the first part of what we need to do. Uh, if I can get this thing to... Okay, second thing is this point P that we've now figured out how to write the coordinates of that point P, that's what I need to rotate by an angle S counterclockwise around the z-axis, right? Again, that's what S does. S says how far you have to rotate around the z-axis to get from in the xz plane to where you're, wherever you actually are kind of a longitude sort of a thing. Um, and uh, this is a linear algebra problem. So again, a good exercise for y'all. Uh, reminder, uh, uh, I'm going to be making a lot of use. This is just one example of many that we've already seen, many more to come, where we're going to use rotations and reflections and things like that. And the big idea is to recognize that this is a linear transformation. Linear transformations are represented by matrices. Matrices are understood by their columns. And the columns are the images of the standard basis vector. So some geometry and trig ensues. Make sure that you can do this. Make sure that you can produce this as being that rotation matrix. As always, if you don't feel like you know how to do this, or if you get stuck in the process of doing this, or if you get something that's different from what I have, whatever, um, come talk to me. 
right? Come to office hours. I'll be very happy to walk you through it and explain, you know, remind you of how all these details work, and uh, we want to make sure we can get everybody doing this. Okay, so um, it's basically all over at this point. Uh, we have this dark blue point P. Worked out earlier. Uh, the process of rotating it by the angle S we just discussed. The result of that rotation is our point X that we're trying to describe. And the final result is what you get when you actually multiply that all out. And here's your final answer. Um, that's the parameterization of this torus. Everybody okay with that? Okay. <clears throat> okay, next method. I think this is the last one. Yeah. Uh, last trick I'm going to show you. I think really useful. Um, sometimes you will already have a parameterization of something similar. And it's just a question of how to tweak it. So, uh, for example, uh, let's take uh, the unit sphere. Now, the unit sphere is described by uh, rho equals 1. Remember, we have the spherical graph parameterization, where you plug in rho equals 1 into your existing conversion formulas, and the result is this parameterization for the unit sphere. Everybody all right with that part? Which I can rewrite like, I mean, it's the same thing here, uh, just you know, writing it out separately in coordinates instead of uh, as a sort of a whole. Okay, the question we face is we want to uh, figure out how to parameterize this ellipsoid. Now, an ellipsoid is not the same thing as a sphere. Definitely not, right? But there is a pretty close similarity because, after all, the sphere, you look at the equation for the sphere and you look at the equation for the ellipsoid, they're no, not that different, right? There's a lot of similar structural similarities. And in fact, we're kind of having flashbacks now to, again, early chapter two. And we recall that when you do a, a deformation, like if you replace every x with x over a, we know what that does. That's just going to stretch your surface by a factor of a in the x direction. Is that, is that good? Is everybody OK with that? Cool. So uh, there's a couple different ways you can capitalize on this. One thing you can do is say, well, look, I, I, this is how I parameterize a sphere. I can see these, these formulas right here for x, y, and z. I can use those as starting points and then say, well, on this blue ellipsoid, all of my x coordinates are going to be a factor of a bigger. So I will literally multiply what I had by A. And that accounts for the fact that this ellipsoid is just stretching uh, what I'd had by a factor of A. There, this is literally the A. And then uh, likewise, uh, replacing Y with Y over B means we're going to be stretching in the y direction by a factor of b, and there it is. And likewise for the z coordinate. Everybody okay with that? Kind of a nice observation that you can just interpret, you know, again, one of these algebraic tweaks, interpret what it's doing geometrically, and then just make it happen right there in your parameterization. <laughs> uh, now, here's an alternative way to think about it. Suit yourself. Um, <clears throat> alternative way to think about it is that, uh, well, again, I had had these equations, and uh, what do I do? How do I deal with whatever the result is of replacing x with x over a? You can just literally replace x with x over a. It, the, parametric equations are, in fact, still equations, right? So you could do it like that. And then likewise, replace y with y over b, you know, et cetera, on down the, the list. Um, that will give you instead uh, uh, these 
equations where you notice your A and your B there like that. And uh, students do sometimes get a little confused as to, well, wait a minute, do, uh, do I multiply by A or do I divide by A? Which is it? Over here I multiply it, over there I divide it. Right? And again, it's a matter of what are you multiplying or dividing. On the left side over here, I've taken the expression that equals x, and I've multiplied it by a. That is not what I did over here. What I did over here is I divided the variable itself within the equation by a. And I claim these are actually effectively the same thing because if I rewrite, let me just uh, get rid of all this highlighting, uh, if I remind myself that this is literally x, y, z, right? and then if I look at this equation versus that equation, they are pretty much exactly the same equation. Uh, the only difference is, is that A is on one side of the equation versus the other side of the equation. Not really that different. Everybody okay with that? All right. Okay, real quick comment before we go on to the next thing. Um, I uh, will point out that the book has a bunch of examples of parametric surfaces, and they're fine examples. One of them, in fact, is the donut. But they uh, come at most of their examples in a pretty different way. Um, and uh, frankly, I think my way is better. Um, so what the book does, the book comes to you with a parameterization and says, here's a parameterization of the surface. And then the work of their example is to try to figure out what surface is it. Right? And I'm going to point out that in practice, day to day, real life, you know, life as an engineer, life as a physicist, my experience anyway was that it went the other way around. Most of the time, there was a surface that I needed to deal with, and I needed to create the parameterization. I didn't have the luxury of, here's your parameterization, right? I needed to take an equation or some geometric description or something like that and turn it into a parameterization. So you'll notice that in all the examples, well, most of the examples I've given you here, they take the form of creating the parameterization. I think that's the more useful skill. Um, and the examples in the book are sort of the opposite of that. So, anyway, all right. Okay, moving along. Um, <clears throat> couple of innocent observations. Here's a parametric surface. Uh, position as a function of two parameters, S and T. Right? That's a parametric surface. Um, I, uh, if you have two variables, I make the observation that uh, if you fix one of them so that it's no longer a variable, now you have one variable. <laughs> right? So like I say, pretty innocent observation. Uh, your result is that you have a function of just one variable. It remains that you are talking about position as a function of what is now, again, with t fixed. Just one variable, and position as a function of one variable is a curve. So, uh, like I say, it's an observation, but uh, this, is, this idea of fixing one of your parameters turns a parametric surface into a parametric curve. And uh, we call these the coordinate curves. Uh, so what I have here, uh, fixing t and thinking of position as a function of s, is called the s coordinate curve of that parameterization. Let me show you a, uh, an example, an explicit example here. We uh, will look at the unit sphere. And the unit sphere, uh, recall we talked about the uh, rho equals 1 spherical graph parameterization. Uh, this produces uh, this unit sphere. And uh, let's look at the two different coordinate curves. I'm going to start by fixing theta. Theta constant. So over here in our pullback space, you know, phi theta space, uh, theta is now fixed. Not allowed to change. Uh, I can now ask, well, what happens as I move along that fixed line? 
where theta is still pi over four, but as phi goes from you know zero and starts increasing, uh, what happens on the surface itself? And what happens is we stay entirely within this plane where theta is pi over four. That's what theta equals pi over four looks like. So that being constant, we're gonna be stuck in this plane and we move as described here, phi starts to increase, and so we just move kind of down, uh, what you might call a meridian, right? Down a line of longitude, uh, like, uh, like that. So that is called a phi coordinate curve because phi is what remained a variable because it was theta that I kept constant. Everybody all right? Okay. All right, now of course you can do uh, the opposite. You can say, let's suppose that I fix phi, pi over six. What does that look like? What, it, what is it when phi is constant? Uh, what does that look like? Well, the, keeping in mind that phi is angle off of the z-axis, a constant value of phi would suggest that we're looking at a cone. So we're going to be now be stuck in that cone. Phi is not allowed to change. Phi is stuck at pi over six. And now, as I move in the theta direction, I move kind of like that, kind of around a line of latitude, as it were. Uh, make sense to everybody? So these are our these are our phi and theta coordinate. Oh, this is the theta, right? So these are the phi and theta coordinate curves uh, for this for this parameterization of our sphere. Yeah. Sorry, so in this, like, isn't theta taking all values around the cone, like yeah. all possible values? So yeah. mm -hmm. where exactly does it become constant again? Oh, well, so on this on this theta coordinate curve that I have here, so yeah, phi stays fixed. Phi is pi over 6, and you'll notice as I go around this whole, right, I can go all the way around the world here, and, and uh, phi still stuck at pi over 6. Um, that whole curve is our theta coordinate curve. I'm not sure if I answered your question. Yeah. So when you so then when you fix theta as well, is it just like one slice of this cone? Oh well. Uh, so you have to decide which one variable you're going to fix, okay. right? So you can't fix them both. If you fix them both, then you just have a point. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you want to fix phi, as I've done here, then you get the theta coordinate curve that goes kind of around. Yeah, yeah. If you want to fix theta, then now phi is a variable, and then you get what we had before. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. All right. All right. Okay, so what? So here's a neat observation uh, right here. Partial derivatives of a surface parameterization are velocities of coordinate curves. Now it's not obvious at a first glance. Right? We gotta think through uh, you know, one little bit at a time. Wait a minute, what does this mean? And then what does that mean? And sort of you know, piece it together. But uh, it's gonna turn out to be that these are in fact exactly the same things just with different language. So let me walk us through it. Uh, let's talk first about one of these curves. Let's talk about a coordinate curve. Coming back up here to our definition. Here's our definition. Uh, a, uh, an S coordinate curve is what you get when S remains a function and you fix the other variable, T, and we consider position as a function of just the one coordinate S, right? There's, there's our S coordinate curve. Okay, next question. How do I take a velocity of one of these curves? How do I take a velocity of this S coordinate curve? Well, position is a function of S. Velocity would mean just <coughs> taking the derivative with respect to S. So I'm gonna just kinda put a, uh, you know, uh, partial with respect to S here. All right, so S coordinate curve. Uh, taking the velocity means we're gonna take the derivative with respect to that variable. 
And now let's ask, what have we done? Like all together, we had x, y, and z as functions of s and t. We chose to treat t as a constant and then subsequently take the derivative with respect to the other variable. That's literally a partial derivative. That's just write down the pipe definition of a partial derivative is where you hold all the other variables constant and yet take the derivative with respect to the one remaining. Again, straight up, write down the pipe, exactly a partial derivative. That cool? So said differently, um, if we find ourselves uh, looking at a velocity and trying to figure out how we would write down a velocity of a coordinate curve, partial derivative. Very easy way to write down what one of those velocities is. So where we're going to use that is in this circumstance here. And uh, I want to relate, uh, let's see here, I want to relate, for example, this little differential d phi in phi theta world, right? If I'm at some point on the sphere with certain coordinates and I want to just move just a little bit in the phi direction, well, what's going to be the resulting output differential? How do I relate uh, this input differential to that output differential? Uh, how do I relate this input change to this output change? And again, the verbal knee, knee jerk uh, reflex, right? Uh, the relationship to input change and output change is derivative, right? So in fact, um, uh, the thing that I multiply by the input change to get the output change here is the velocity. And the velocity, uh, let's see here, uh, the velocity is the partial derivative partial of x with respect to phi. Right? So again, this is what you multiply by uh, input differential to get output differential. And therefore, we have a nice little handy dandy formula for this little output differential. It's x phi d phi. Nice, clever little observation. Um, and then uh, likewise for the other one in the theta direction. Okay. So what this buys us uh, is that uh, even though what I wrote down here was about vectors and uh, displacements and differentials, it allows us to look at the area in between and relate those, right? So, uh, so this vector, this input differential gives that output differential, and this input differential gives this output differential, but in between these, I could ask the very reasonable question, um, given this area in the phi theta world, what is the resulting output area on the surface? What's the relationship between that orange input area and this purple output area? And uh, again, a little geometry problem comes up, and we, you know, we know how to do these geometry problems. Uh, this output area, oh, uh, you know what, I made some bad color choices. This output area that I'm going to do now in blue, that output area is a little parallelogram. You want to compute the area of a parallelogram? No problem. It's the magnitude of the cross product of the edge vectors. Chapter 1, somewhere uh, early, chapter 1, Math 218, possibly even, right? Formula for the uh, area of a parallelogram. Uh, and I can relate that to d phi d theta, which you'll notice are right in here, and which factor out. And all together, very convenient final answer. The, the mass, the relationship between the input area and the output area is this stretching factor right there. So what you multiply by that to get that is the magnitude of the cross product of the partials of your parameterization. Everybody follow?
Okay, um, this is going to be a big deal. We're going to make a lot of use out of this. Uh, this, um, you know, uh, uh, area stretching factor on a parameterization. Um, and it's going to play out over kind of the rest of the course. Um, before we uh, make a use of it, there's some uh, notation and semantics and observations that we have to kind of get said. Uh, first thing I'm going to point out is that this vector, this cross product of partials, the thing whose magnitude is the stretching factor is actually interesting for other reasons in addition to this. Uh, but for example, one thing you'll notice right away, uh, being a cross product of tangent vectors, it's a normal vector. It's perpendicular to our surface. So we're going to call it a normal vector. We're going to give it the name capital N, like so. And having it renamed, we can now have a slightly more compact uh, expression for our uh, stretching factor, our area stretching factor is now, it's the magnitude of capital N. It's just a little bit easier to write that way. Uh, it's going to come up a lot. We're going to be writing it down a bazillion times and it's just nice to have that streamlined. So capital N is a uh, pretty, uh, pretty typical choice for what to call this. Now terminology, I like to call this the parameter, oh uh, wrong color, uh, I like to call this the parametrized normal vector. For one thing, it's literally perpendicular to the surface. It is a normal vector. So that part stands to reason. I call it the parametrized normal vector because notice it comes from the parametrization. You look at the formula here for n. It comes out of a parameter. Whatever your parametrization is, x, right? however you've parametrized your surface, this is a result of that parameterization. It depends on your parameterization. And I cannot emphasize enough, there's so many parameterizations. There's endless numbers of parameterizations for any surface, right? So this is not intrinsic to the surface itself. The surface itself <coughs> could be parameterized lots of different ways. You would get different capital N's depending on what different parameterization you pick. So, I don't, I, so we can't just call it just the normal vector. There's too many, right? So I call it parameterized normal because it comes from your parameterization. Um, for whatever it's worth, the book likes to call this the standard normal vector. I find that term confusing. To me, that makes it sound like it's the standard for the surface. And again, it isn't. The surface has lots of parameterizations all of which have all different normal vectors. I just feel it's kind of weird to have the term standard when there could be a lot of them, and they're all standard. That doesn't sound right to me. <laughs> I just think that's confusing. Uh, anyway. <coughs> Whatever. Yeah? So would the normal vector of a different parameterization like still be normal to the same surface? Yeah, it'd still be normal to the surface, but it could, uh, so for example, instead of pointing, uh, you know what, I shouldn't have done this in the highlighter. Let me let me do this again in, in a, a pen. So maybe this was the capital N that we came up with for one of our parameterizations. You pick a different parameterization. It could be like that, or it could be like this, or it could be like that. I mean, they'll all be perpendicular to the surface, but they'll have different magnitudes, and they might point the other way. But all perpendicular to the surface. So if you if you unitize them, they'd probably be unlike I don't know. If you yes, if you that's right. If you if you turn if you divide them by their own magnitudes, well, there's still the issue though. If it could well, go the, the sign, one okay. way or the other, yeah, the sign is still a, still a question mark. Yeah. If you have multiple um, normal vectors with different magnitudes, yeah, wouldn't you get a different stretching factor? Yep, absolutely. Absolutely, and again, that's uh, a little unsettling, but keep in mind the purpose of these uh, stretching factors, right, is to relate these areas to those areas. It's for when you pull back through the parameterization. So yes, you will have a different stretching factor, but you'll be pulling back to a different domain. Uh -huh. And it's all gonna work out, right? It, ultimately, it won't matter in the end. You know, you'll get the same You'll get the same, uh, like if you know, if you we're going to momentarily we're going to use this idea to compute this total surface area, right? You're going to get the same answer in either way, right? 
but uh, you would, if you use a different parameterization, then you'd have a totally different integral over a totally different domain that would get the same final value. Yeah. All right. Everybody good? Okay. All right. Uh, let's see here. So, uh, yeah, in fact, I think we're ready now to actually do that calculation. Let's compute the, uh, the area of the unit sphere. Um, now, <clears throat> we know we're going to we know we're going to be pulling back through a parameterization, so we're going to need to figure out a parameterization. Um, I'm going to go with our uh, existing parameterization of the unit sphere that we've used more than once. There it is. And now we've got to go through this three-step process. Uh, again, I need this capital N thing. Uh, you know, so starting with our parameterization, notice I'm going to have to take the partials, and then I'm going to have to take the cross product. And then in order to get my stretching factor, I'm going to need to compute the magnitude. All right, so three-step process. Partials, cross, magnitude. Here we go. Uh, partials, uh, cross, tedium ensues, <laughs> right? Uh, and then magnitude, and again, more tedium ensues, and uh, the final answer ends up being just sine phi. Now, um, I just, I just kind of waved my hands at a, at a pretty substantial amount of algebra. Um, I do think that it's a healthy exercise, right? I mean, uh, details matter, <laughs> sad to say, right? But uh, the details that are involved in this are details that y'all are perfectly qualified to crank through on your own. You don't need my help for that. Uh, I'm happy to help if you get stuck, of course. But I think you can crank through all this. So what I want y'all to do is to take this parameterization that I just started with, compute the partials. By the way, this is what you're going to get. Make sure you get this. Then take their cross product, which is a lot to write down and it's annoying. <clears throat> this is what you're going to get. Make sure that you get this. Then compute the magnitude and again, it gets big, right? It gets, uh, there's a lot to write down. But the Pythagorean identity kicks in a bunch of times, and the result is that all of the ugliness that you would imagine that you would have looking at the formula for this vector and thinking about taking the magnitude, right, squaring all these things, adding them up, taking the square root, seems like it'd be insane. It all simplifies down to sine phi. And again, healthy exercise. I think it's worth the five minutes that it'll take you to do that. Everybody should do that once in a while. Okay, um, and uh, again, it's kind of it's kind of all over, but the shouting at this point, a lot of details to keep track of. But we our goal was to compute the total surface area, which I chop up into little pieces, and the whole is the sum of the parts. Right. Um, any given little piece of surface area, I can pull back through the parameterization, and there's my stretching factor, right? calculation we did at the top of this page was that ds was stretching factor times d phi d theta. Uh, we just got through computing that stretching factor, and it is sine phi integral, not even a hard integral, pretty easy integral, and answer, and we're done. And we knew this is the right answer anyway. Everybody good? Okay, so uh, what we have here is just kind of a summary of what we've been talking about. Um, the, the pictures that I had drawn previously were on the sphere. I like to have kind of a relatable, straightforward starting example to kind of develop the ideas. This is what you might call a more general uh, representation of those ideas. And again, we've already talked about all these things. We have uh, input differentials and their corresponding output differentials that come from the uh, velocities, aka the partial derivatives. 
for which we are interested in the area which we compute as a cross product, blah, 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 all the details on the previous page, right? So pretty much everything that's on this picture we've already discussed um, with uh, really kind of just one exception, and that is that this formula right here, I've got this written as a cross product of two vectors, and that's what it is. It's cross product of two vectors. Uh, I'll point out that vectors really are the kind of the elemental objects of study in this class. A lot of people get confused about this and think that coordinates are the elemental objects of study. It's not really true. Coordinates are a distraction. Coordinates depend on what basis you're using. Bases are kind of arbitrary. That's a distraction. The fundamental elemental objects that you should be thinking in terms of are the vectors themselves. So this is, I, it, for my sort of aesthetic, if only, uh, I think this is the right way to think about the formula for the normal vector. That said, you can write it out in coordinates, right? Partial derivatives, one coordinate at a time. You can take this cross product and you can crank it out one coordinate at a time. And what you get, you will notice each one of those coordinates of this cross product is a little 2 by 2 Jacobian determinant. Just like we had when we were doing two-dimensional change of variables. Now that's unexpected, right? Uh, two-dimensional change of variables is a totally different question. Here we're looking at a parametric surface in three space. Why do we have two-dimensional Jacobian determinants? And it turns out there's actually a really good reason for this. Uh, it is actually natural from a certain point of view, and wouldn't it be nice if we had time and then I could go through and talk about that, but we don't. So uh, I am going to wave my hands at this uh, a little while later and give you some sort of a rough sense for kind of morally why should this have happened. But uh, that'll be that'll be later uh, down the road. Yes. It's the it's it's this vector here. It's the capital N. Oh, you're you're talking about uh, this vector right here. Yeah. That's our that's the unit normal vector. Uh, and uh, we've talked about unit normal vectors previously. They're just unit vectors that point in the perpendicular direction. So there's a lot of different vectors that all point perpendicular. This one's interesting because of its magnitude relating to the stretching factor from the parameterization. This one's interesting because unit vectors are intrinsically interesting. So I, I'm just putting it on here because it's part of the story um, and in a different way. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's the, the. I'm not sure if I answered your question. Yes. Okay. Cool. Okay. All right. Okay. So this is a little bit of foreshadowing that we'll we'll come back to later. Um, last thing I want to show y'all real quick is um, a special case that's nice to have locked and loaded uh, for when circumstances arise and you don't want to have to go through the whole process that we just. You know, it, it can get kind of tedious, right? The special case is if you're looking at a graph. What's nice about this special case is that if you're looking at a graph and if you plan reasonably to use the graph parameterization, the calculation always goes through exactly the same. And so uh, here's your graph parameterization. Here's your partials. It's always going to look exactly like that. Um, here's your cross product. The magnitude, it's always going to be this, <laughs> right? So handy little formula, and I encourage you to have this memorized and ready to, ready to go. If you find yourself looking at a graph, you can just go directly right to there. All that work done for you. So make sure to have this memorized. Um, and then I'm going to make one last little uh, quick observation, which is to notice that this business is clearly just the magnitude squared of the gradient. And wait a second, though, gradient, uh, should I use this? Gra magnitude of the gradient is steepness of the graph. 
So what's kind of beautiful about this is that our area stretching factor can be thought of entirely geometrically. If you're talking about a graph, the magnitude, excuse me, the area stretching factor is entirely a function of how steep is your graph in this specific way. And where that is useful is in an example like this. Uh, just a neat little quick observation. Um, uh, roofs on houses are graphs. And furthermore, this steepness, you know, how, how steep is it? If you were standing up there, you know, how steep would it seem? Uh, that steepness on most houses, that steepness is the same on all of these various little sections. You've got triangles and parallelograms and uh, whatever these other things are called, trapezoids or whatever, right? Um, so if you're interested in computing the area of your roof, such as if you're going to put a new roof on your house, notice you can relate that to just the footprint area because the stretching factor is a constant. That's kind of a neat observation. It's much easier to compute the footprint area because that's rectangles rather than climb up on the roof and measure, get a protractor and measure these angles and oh my gosh, right? Nightmare calculation. The green calculation is much easier. Y'all have a great weekend. See you later. Um, see you on Monday.